Welcome to Leadership from the Cross with Pastor Scott Tom. This broadcast is devoted to taking your ministry and life to the next level. No matter what the level you are at, let us help advance your leadership skills. Leadership from the Cross is a ministry of Cross Christian Fellowship in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And now, Pastor Scott Tom. I implore Eudia and I implore Sintiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. That's in Philippians 4.2. Why was Paul writing this? Because people weren't getting along in ministry. Here were two ladies, godly ladies, not working together. And because of that, they were causing problems in the church because it got back to Paul. And this happens quite frequently in ministry. We kind of think that ministry is, oh, going to be perfect. And you come into this scenario where everybody's saved and caring and loving and nothing goes wrong, but that's not ministry. I mean, it can happen. There's certain days that are going to be like that. But for the most part, we are sinners and we fall short. And not everybody's trained. Not everybody's up to speed. Not everybody's at the same maturity level. And you as a leader are going to have to deal with that. And it can become very frustrating and you can feel like you want to explode or people just aren't getting it. But you have to have a mindset that these are opportunities to lead and to train because you're never going to have a perfect environment until we get to heaven. And so this is what leaders do. Leaders overcome difficulties. They overcome conflicts. They overcome obstacles. And they do so with competence. They do so with care. And in in doing that, you then have people who will follow you and buy into the system because there's a leader. There's somebody I can follow. So let's cover what I think are some of the top 10 causes of ministry conflict and kind of walk through them. And then how do we overcome them? How do we work through that? Because again, this is something I wish somebody had taken me by the hand and said, hey, you need to understand that ministry is going to be messy and you are going to have to navigate through this and lead people through it and not let it overcome you. And so the top 10 causes of ministry conflict, let's look at the first one. Number one, jealousy. Jealousy, I think, goes along with worldly competitiveness, that sometimes you get people who are jealous because they're comparing themselves with someone else, or they're just so competitive in a worldly sense. There's nothing wrong with being competitive in a godly sense. Paul says that he pushed on, that Paul says that he fought the good fight. You should be, in some sense, competitive, but not in a way that pits ministries against one another or ministers against one another. This jealousy or worldly competitive sees somebody else as a threat, even though they're on the same team. It comes from insecurity. It comes from not knowing really the value in ministry and of servant leadership. This is a problem that's going to cause interpersonal strife or interministry strife. Paul saw this. In 1 Corinthians 1, even, he's got a, the whole letter starts out with this. It says, now I plead with you, brethren. I plead, I beg you, come on, man, is what he's saying. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there are no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, that those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. You're striving, you're bickering, there's jealousies, there's things going on. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? 
Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Those are rhetorical questions saying, no, we're, we're all under Christ. So you've got to be able to appeal to people not to choose sides, not to compare people or compare ministries or whatever. And it's so easy to do, isn't it? We can fall into that trap very, very quickly. But just walking in a realistic, humble attitude and take glory in the Lord. So a realistic, humble attitude is, you know what? I'm not going to really take sides on this. I'm, there's not neither right or wrong in this. It's just a lot of this is we're, we're pushing. We're on the same team. We're not... We don't have to take sides. It's like with a team that has a quarterback controversy and you got two good quarterbacks. What happens is you start dividing the team, the fans, the office, the leadership, the coaches begin to take sides. Well, we're going to win more with this guy. We're going to win more with that guy. We're going to be, but wait, when you start doing that to a certain level, then you start pitting the team, the players, the organization against itself. When you really should take this as, man, we've got two good quarterbacks. We're in a good position. We don't have to take sides. We could win with both. Let's let's do what's best for the team, and let's keep team on our mind, and we don't have to make this that we pit ourselves against each other when we're on the same team. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, ultimately, Jesus is the head, right? And ultimately, he's paid the price. And so we're all servants here. And the same goal is to glorify him. And so we've got to bring it back to what is going to be the best case scenario? What is going to glorify the Lord more? Sometimes we take a back seat so somebody can get more learning. Somebody can be in the front and vice versa. Because it's for the glory of the Lord, not my glory. So we need to remind ourselves and remind others that God has different plans for us, and we're all on different levels of maturity. We're on different levels of knowledge, and to compare really isn't doing anybody any good. It's not benefiting the ministry. If you have to compare because you're the one responsible for the decision, do so, but don't pit ministry against ministry. And make sure all parts of the team get praise. Remember when David was basically on the other side for a little bit? He's with the Philistines, but he's playing a role. He's destroying other villages and then saying that he's raiding Judah and the southern parts of Israel. But he wasn't. But he's then held out of the scuffle with Israel. But his own camp gets hit. And they come back and they find that their women and children, their goods are gone. And they've already traveled a long distance. They've already been in, they're already injured from previous battles and other things, I'm assuming. And some of the people, when they're traveling, just grow weary. And they're like, we can't go on. And they left them with the stuff. And they said, you stay here. You guard the stuff. Don't let anything more happen. We'll take your provisions, we'll move on. And they were able to go recover the things. And the people said, hey, we're not going to give them their share. And David said, no, these are people that have been riding with us. These are people who've been fighting alongside of of us. These are people who watched the stuff and made sure the rest of our things weren't stolen. They also deserve part of the spoil. They're important too. And that will help you in this whole idea of people having a jealousy or competitiveness. The second problem that's going to cause conflict in ministry is going to be a ministry of abuse where, not physical or verbal abuse, but abuse of time or materials. So you have ministry abuse of the resources. And this is where Let's say you have somebody lazy in ministry. might even be a leader. It might even be a pastor. It might even be you that's causing part of the conflict because you don't take responsibility. You don't step up. You don't do the work that's necessary. Or this could be somebody who's just wasteful in ministry or is inattentive 
to detail. They're just not paying attention. They don't take care of things. They get things done, but it's always at the last minute. People have got to jump in, lend in their hand. They don't think through things. They're not being inclusive in emails. They they just aren't getting the job done the way it should be done. They're getting it, but it's always laborious. And then people around these type of people, people who are working in ministry around the the lazy or the wasteful or the inattentive, they start to get frustrated, especially if they're very diligent, especially if they're very resourceful, especially if they are caring and not wasteful, then this starts to be a, a problem. When you run into people who always take and never give, they're always taking of time, always taking of resources. They're never giving. They're neglecting people. It's going to cause a conflict if it's not addressed. Let me give you a simple example of that you wouldn't think would cause problem, but go into any office that has a coffee pot or has, even when they have the, you know, little cups for the, machines and stuff like that. If somebody uses the last one or doesn't fill it up or leaves the pot empty or doesn't fill up the water, somebody's going to hear about it. After a while, people blow up, don't they? Because, oh, took the last cup of coffee and didn't make a new pot, right? Or didn't freshen up the pot. And usually there's always somebody who comes in and keeps the peace because they are the coffee maker. But they're doing it so because other people aren't doing it. People resent when other people hand off their work and they never pick up the load for others. This becomes a problem or people who are just abusive in that. I remember when we had somebody in ministry who was taking from other people's lunches. And this went on for weeks and people were starting to get mad. because, And I could see why. You come in and you're looking forward to your lunch. You open it up and, hey... Who took my side? Or somebody cut out part of my sandwich. They took a fourth of my sandwich. Or they had some kind of cookies or something in there they were looking forward to. And somebody took them. And you talk about a mutiny. It's hilarious. And this happened to be one young man who was just like this. Lazy, too lazy to go to make his lunch in the morning. Oh, and his excuse was, we're all Christians, we're sharing, we're supposed to share, and I would share my lunch if I had a lunch here. And yeah, that's the problem. You don't have a lunch here. You didn't bring it in. These things can cause real problems. These are minor things. I'm giving you simple examples. But when you've got somebody who's being unethical or or just taking from other people, taking time or being wasteful or inattentive, those type of things, When other people are putting in a labor of love and have a high ethical standard, then they get angry and you're going to have a problem because you got people who are men pleasers and people who are not men pleasers. And Ephesians 6, 5 through 6 talks about being bond servants or just switch it over to ministers or employees. It says, be obedient to those who are your masters or overseeing you according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, obeying from the heart and trying to be accountable. See, making people accountable. How do you get over that? Teach people that they should hold themselves accountable and then hold people accountable on certain things where it's meaningful to people. So, It also means always teaching and working on character as a leader for yourself and for others, because if you're doing it, it'll inspire them. And if you're pushing people, they'll rise to the occasion. So that's the second thing. Abusive of time, energy, or inattentiveness. It's going to cause that conflict. The third thing is uh, just somebody who's in the wrong designation. Maybe it's the right person, but wrong calling where they're in the they're in the ministry but in the wrong part of ministry so they are 
gifted in other areas, but they're put in an area where they're not very gifted, and that begins to frustrate people and frustrates that person. Now, sometimes this is necessary. Sometimes you need help in certain places, and we all step up. It's just like Timothy, who wasn't necessarily evangelist, but was called and reminded by Paul saying, hey, don't neglect this. Do this. So there are certain things we're going to have to step up. It's not maybe our direct ministry, but we are called to do whatever's needed in ministry. So we should do so. And when doing that, we all oftentimes come away appreciating that person, having greater empathy and broader wisdom and understanding of their needs and what they're going through when you're helping out. For example, I remember when uh, we were doing construction and we were short on people helping with the children's ministry. And in those two areas, I had to go from helping with construction on a Sunday morning because we had uh, a we had an inspection due the next morning, and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, the inspector moved up his time. We're not quite ready. We just, this one time, I'm going to pull you out of your normal ministry. You're going to do in construction. But then we didn't have enough people showing up to help with the children's ministry. So they said, hey, Scott, we're, we're going to call upon you to teach this children's class because we don't have anybody in you out of the guys who we pulled to do construction probably can come up with a study for these kids out of the blue or on the run, so to speak, better than they can. So jump in here. Oh my gosh, I felt so out of my element. First of all, the kids are making fun, you know, because here I am, I'm covered in drywall dust. And I was cleaning some areas and doing some other things there. They were drywalling in some areas. And I'm stumbling through this. And so, you know, some of the kids were a little bit mean making fun of me because this was a junior high ministry. And so I just went with it. And I just made a game out of it and that I was going to come over and give them a great big hug if they didn't answer my question. But everybody's like, oh, don't don't let Pastor Scott come over here and get drywall dust all over. So they started teaming together, come up with the answers to the questions, and it worked out. But boy, I appreciated the people who worked in the children's ministry and other the other people who were doing some of the construction and whatever, and just it, it was needed at the time. Now, Sometimes, though, if a a person's put in a permanent place, they begin to get frustrated because they have certain expectations of this is going to happen or that's going to happen. People who can't get it done because it's really, they're really out of their comfort zone, they're out of where their skill set is. And other people begin to resent the extra burden that falls upon them because they're having to jump in. And if it happens all the time, it becomes a problem, right? So here, what did, what to do with this? If you've got somebody who's in a ministry and they don't belong there, don't be afraid to move people around. And don't be afraid to try them in other areas so that they find their gifts and their niche. Also, I think it would be good if you tell people when they go into the ministry that this is probationary and you may move them around. That, hey, if you're in this ministry, you like it, you let me know. If you're fitting in there, we're going to put you and keep you there. But you may not like it. If we have a place, let's put you in that place. If not, then we have to to deal with that issue. But let's not cross that bridge till we get there. So if you have people already setting up an idea of, hey, I may be moved around, they're less afraid of letting go of the position or the place if that's something you do regularly or if you tell people you're going to be doing that. And then they'll actually be looking forward to finding a place where they fit in and it fits their ministry style and everything else. So nip this in the bud early on by setting people up to say, hey, we're going to be flexible, we may move you around. Also sometimes, and this is the fourth thing that ambitions or desires are out of sync or out of time with the ministry. Mm, sometimes this is where people have greater ambitions and they think they should be the they should be the ministry leader or they should be the pastor. And it might be a genuine calling. They may be called out in the future to go 
pastor or lead. And I think this goes back to the the two consecutive studies we did on following, being a leader by learning, first learning to be a follower. And so a person could have a genuine calling, but mess up ministry because they think they should be leading and they overstep their bounds and they end up disrespecting that leader or that pastor or whatever. And it just causes problems. And especially if they start talking about it, this reminds you of Absalom in the Bible as he overthrew his father, David, because he thought he should be doing these things. It was his time, right? Didn't wait. So he began to speak to people and have them choose sides because he would say, oh, well, that would be, wouldn't be my ministry way of handling this. I would handle it a different way. That's going to be a problem, and that causes problem in ministry. And you need to encourage those strong leaders, but also be able to tell them to put on the brakes, that they need to wait their turn, that they need more training or whatever. And if they can't, hold on to that. If they become devious in any way, like an Absalom, If they start lying about things or they start pitting people against leaders or leaders against each other or begins to gossip, confront them immediately. And if this is a pattern that they're doing, then you need to handle it accordingly. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. Why? Because then you're going to have to answer to the Lord. So the fifth thing is a rebellious sin in the camp. And this is kind of obvious, but this happens. And yes, it happens in ministry, and you get people who are just caught up in things. Um, There's few things that begin to hinder or destroy a pastor or staff relationships like sin. We all sin, and we all fall short. That's, That's a given. But I'm talking about repetitive sin that undermines ministry or disqualifies a minister. Strife hinders ministry, right? Causes people to take sides. We've talked about that. A disqualifying sin, false doctrine, drunkenness, adultery, drug use. Those are kind of things that would actually sit you on this, the, sit a person on the shelf. And if it doesn't happen, then there's going to be a big rebellion in the camp. And if you don't handle it, you remember that the camp will do in excess what the leader allows in moderation. The higher you go up in leadership, the more of a servant you must become. And when, he, when Jesus teaches this, he isn't teaching that you become the person who's going to serve everybody dinner and cook everybody's meals and clean everybody's plate and washes everybody's clothes. You can't do that. But you serve in greater capacities, and one of the greatest capacity you can serve it in is that you give up more freedoms for the greater good. So you become the servant of all, so you have to take an account of everybody who you're serving as to your actions, your morality, your ethics, your holiness, your character. So if you become the servant of all, you hold yourself to a greater accountability, and which may mean you have to give up freedoms for the greater good. So how do you do this, and how do you handle this type of thing? Well, be a preacher of holiness, be a person of holiness, and then expect it from your leaders. And when they don't, handle it appropriately. Restore them if you can. Sit them down if you, if you must. Ask them to leave if that's the only way that you can deal with it. Like if it's egregious, something like a First Corinthians chapter five or something like that. Six, the sixth thing that causes conflict in ministry, it's the oh, I don't know, practical preferences. This could be something like even generational differences. This is the nuances of ministry, how you should do ministry. And there's a number of ways you can get ministry done and accomplished. And some people really like to send emails. Other people like to text. Other people like super organization and lots of meetings. Other people don't like meetings. Hey, they, if you have a way of doing it and it's effective, even if it's not the best, 
let it happen that way. But sometimes we get to a place where we take differences and we exaggerate them. We make it a point of contention in ministry because there's just practical preferences, practical differences between groups, between people, between genders, between age groups. You can just get on that. And everybody thinks they have the ideal ministry plan until you're in ministry. And then you're like, dear Lord, help. (laughs) Because you think you got, oh, I would do it so much different. Well, let me tell you what, even if you've been doing it for a long time and you start doing it on your own or everything's on your shoulders, it's easier said than done sometimes. So we've got to make sure that we are being flexible, that we borrow the best and chuck the rest. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What's good about it? What can we borrow from that? What is something that is? If it's working, okay, can we tweak it? Can we make it a little bit better? But let's not let's not be so dogmatic that we lose everything just because there's small differences. Right? So be flexible, borrow the best, chuck the rest, allow people to fail and learn as they go but not make this a point of contention and quarrel over it. Because Paul writes Timothy again, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, he says this, and and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. What is it saying? But first, don't quarrel, but be gentle about it. And then be able to teach, and do so these things with patience. And that's what we're called to do. Be flexible, be patient, be able to teach, be able to learn in the situation, and you can go from that. The seventh thing is basically uh, theological disagreements, theological differences, but that become divisive. These are preferences that are held so deeply And the disagreements go down so problematically that that there's regrettable division. There's truly a divisive spirit over it. And this could be over the doctrine of salvation or prophecy, conspiracy theories, Bible versions, this kind of thing. And there's some things we need to talk about and hash it out. But I'm talking about theological differences that cause serious problems. This is what OCD is for Scripture. You know what OCD is? Obsessive compulsive doctrine. You say, wait a minute, that's obsessive compulsive disorder. Just think of it in the scriptural sense. Obsessive compulsive doctrine. These are doctrines that people just cannot drop. It causes divisions because They unnecessarily bring it up. They're a one-string banjo. It's always the topic of every discussion. They stop spiritual growth in their life because of it or in other people's lives because of it. They just can't leave it alone. They have this obsessive, compulsive desire to make everybody believe this doctrine. And if they, if you can't work with them, if you can't tell them, hey, we need to just, can you back off of that a little bit? Can we get these other things going? If they say yes, but they don't do it, it's a problem. They're obsessive compulsive about it. So how do you combat that? Well, have a sound, good statement of faith. Then teach it. Teach doctrine to leadership. Tell them this is what we believe and why we believe it. It'll stop these things from getting too far because people are going to stop this ODC person and say, look, that's not what we believe. I mean, it's great if you do, you know, and we're not talking about heresy or anything like this, but that's not what we're going to teach here. And that's not going to dominate the Bible study or the youth group or the home group or whatever it is. We're not going to allow this to occupy everything. And if that person refuses, don't be afraid to sit him down, put him on the sideline for a while, talk to him, work with him on it, but just say, hey, 
We're not allowing you to teach. Or we're not allowing you to be in here, even though you're not the teacher, but you think you are, and you're you're bringing this up every every home study. We can't allow that. It's okay. After a while, and they don't heed that, then you, you may have to remove that person. But you're at fault if you don't teach doctrine, if you don't have a solid statement of faith, and if you don't refer to it, and you don't know or stand your ground on these things, and you let this thing go, it's going to split a church. It's going to cause conflict. Eight, assume expectations and know that they can cause problems. Expectations, they can cause problems. So think of it this way. If people think one thing but the other thing's happening, then they're in conflict with what they thought should be happening. This is an assumed expectation. Or maybe one's been promised to them and somebody's defaulted on it. So these are either assumed or unfulfilled expectations. They get into ministry and they just say, I thought it would be different. I thought this or I thought that. I thought they would be nicer or you know, wouldn't be as messy, or they would give me more raises, or I would earn more, or whatever it be. I thought I was coming in to do this job, and now I have that job. Well, we talked a little bit about that. So sometimes maybe the job description isn't clear. Maybe the ministry isn't clear. Maybe they didn't understand that ministry is messy. Maybe there was a promise that was unkept, that after six months, you'd be promoted and you'd be teaching, or six months, you would be doing more in ministry. We've got to be careful that we don't promise something and not follow through. And we've got to be careful that we don't set expectations that weren't promised and then be mad at somebody in ministry and feel let down when they never promised that. So it's this is easier to handle. So if you're making promises, make sure that you're realistic in those promises, that you can keep them. If you can't keep them, go to that person, apologize, ask for forgiveness, be open to accommodating them, be open to reminders when they say, hey, you promised this, don't get mad at them, be approachable. And oftentimes that'll clear it up. Open communication fixes most of these problems in this category, expectations and promises that are defaulted on. Just ask them, hey, what's going on? Why are you angry? Why why are you upset? Why is there a problem here? You know, and they can ask why hasn't this been done or that been done? And you can tell them, man, I totally expected to keep that and get that done for you. Here's why, you know, we we, uh, don't have the income or something else happened or we had to deal with an issue that set us back in this area. But most of the time, if you talk to them, you can correct that. Number nine is favoritism, whether it's perceived or not. When you play favorites for somebody, and this is hard to do because sometimes people earn extra things and earn more respect and more privileges, and people think that that's wrong, but it's not. In James, he talks about not giving preferences, right? He's James 2.1, he says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of, the Lord of glory, with partiality. You know, giving preferential treatment, and some of that is wrong. I mean, There are people who go into ministry, they have their best bud in ministry who really doesn't do a lot of the work, and I've seen this happen, where they get more slack, they can take time off, they can have a part-time job where they do it at work or at ministry, the person is less strict with them. I've seen this, for example, with a graphic artist who was on in ministry and would always come in late. And you have your deadline and people are asking you, hey, can you get this in? And so I may have the responsibility to, I have to get this book together, the transcript scripts together and everything. I need to present it to the pastor or the leader or go to the printer or whatever. And so I need that graphic so I can go make this presentation. And this graphic artist walks in at 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon. 
oh, well, I was working on a concept late last night for one of the other ministries or the pastor, or pastor's wife or whatever ministry or whatever. And you're like, yeah, but that's, we all have to work late sometimes. We all have to do it. Why do you get to come in late? Or if you have just your hours, then how am I going to know when I can get my my jobs done or my graphic needs met in the ministry? So it can cause real problems. You got to be fair as possible. If you're making acceptances or allowances, make sure that everybody knows they know why and they know how to work around it if that's the case. But also tell them and show that the same treatment isn't necessarily the fair thing to do. Because that's not how God treats us. We're not treated exactly the same way. In the parable of the talents, some one got five, one got two, one got one. In uh, the ministry, you are graded on or you are judged by responsibility and aptitude. So the person who has more responsibility can receive more and do more and maybe get some leniency in certain things because they're very responsible, but a, another person won't because they're not as responsible and they're on a shorter chain and they're not going to be treated the same way. And that's fair because it's fair on the standard, not how each person is treated. It's how we're led in that standard. And Luke talks about this in Luke 12. He talks about the the servants, that one who knew and one who didn't know. And the one who didn't know was deserving of more stripes, but he didn't get them because he he should be in the sense of if all things being equal, then he would have been he would receive a stricter punishment. But all things are not equal. He didn't have as much responsibility or knowledge or aptitude as the other person. They're held into accountability greater. And then the last one then, the last conflict would be like just salary conflicts. And some people, this can kind of fit in the category of preferential treatment type of thing. But some people could be paid less for doing the same job, that could be a problem. There's going to be a salary conflict in ministry in the sense of, hey, I could get X amount in the world, but here's what I'm getting in ministry. I'm getting a lot less. Well, yeah, if you're still in the world, but you're serving the Lord and he's taking care of you and we don't have the income to guarantee you a salary like that, should pay people responsibly and accordingly, but in ministry, oftentimes it's just not going to be the same amount. And sometimes that's the ministry's fault. The ministry doesn't take care of people. First Timothy 5, 17 says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. And in context, he's talking about financial compensation. So sometimes they should be. Now, if a ministry is being stingy and they could pay, but are using monies for other things that aren't as beneficial as that person is, then maybe they need to re-examine what they're doing. But the person also has to realize you're not going to get the same amount that you would have gotten in the world. And we're producing souls, not invoices. And so you get paid by invoices in the world, but in in the kingdom of God, souls don't necessarily equate to higher salaries. They can, but they don't always do that. So you just got to set your heart on the things above. Make sure you give good recognition for work. This is one of the ways you overcome that. Praise people. You're not stealing their reward. Jesus even you know, praised the the churches in his letters to the churches, and he's going to say, "Well done, thou good and faithful steward." When we when we arrive, if we've done that, you should be able to say that you're not stealing anything from them. They're not asking for the pat on the back. If you give it, so be it. That's great. That's loving thing to do. In all these things, in every way that we are working and doing stuff, this really helps to basically communicate and to get things 
early on so that you stop conflicts from happening. As soon as you start seeing conflicts, try to address the situation. There are other things that come in, but these are the 10 most frequent things that I could think of. There's other articles out there that I think agree with this. There's maybe, you know, when you go through articles out there and they, they're they usually within 80% of one another, eight out of the 10, they'll, they'll pick out. These are the ones that I've seen over the years in ministry. And they don't always happen and they don't have to happen for long periods of time, but they can happen when they do. Now you have at least a blueprint of how you're going to handle it and how you're going to move forward with it. So uh, don't fear them. Use them as opportunities to teach and to build up people, learning experiences, and don't don't get all burdened yourself. But go in with love and half the time just addressing it with communication and love. You'll overcome this so fast many times when you do it. So that should really be a, a help and a blessing to you as you go on in ministry, whatever you're doing in ministry. You're going to have these things. And just remember, ministry is messy, but uh, here's the tools to clean it up. So hopefully you're having great success listening to leadership from the cross and that it's something that you can pass on. So take this pass on, pass it to a friend, tell them, Hey, listen to leadership from the cross. And then ultimately, hopefully maybe you plug into ccfcollege.com where we'd love to train you even more. So, all right, blessed wishes. See you next week. You have been listening to Leadership from the Cross with Pastor Scott Tom of Cross Christian Fellowship in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Check out Pastor Scott's ministry training school and his other radio show, No Other Doctrine, by visiting our website at crossfellowship.org. That's crossfellowship.org. Also, you can visit our Facebook page at facebook forward slash leadership from the cross.